Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very, very excited to be here today. And um, I'm going to talk about my, my thoughts on animal welfare. And this is such a, a broad topic uh, that is sort of intimidating, but this is really what, uh, what I enjoy talking about. And I'm, I hope you do too. So uh, I am um, housed in College Park, but my uh, tenure appointment is predominantly extension. So I do a lot of extension work. Uh, so I go over to where the chickens are on the Domarva Peninsula quite often. Well, I did more before COVID, but I can't wait to get back. So we'll get started here. So um, first we are going to take a, a little journey back in time and revisit some influential factors that um, were involved in the transformation of animal agriculture and animal welfare and assuring animal welfare. Uh, next, we'll cover the fundamentals of animal welfare science and the role of animal welfare science in animal welfare assessments and audits. And then we'll finish up with um, a bit of a, hopefully a discussion on current uh, regional, national, and international animal welfare assurance programs and how they might change in the future. So I really think that in the last century of agricultural advancements, we can really boil it down to two major technological and knowledge innovations in our society, and that's industrialization and genetic selection. Um, so uh, I'd like to start uh, this topic with a, something personal to me. So I am originally from Iowa. Um, and that's, you know, the, the corn capital of the U.S. And um, this is a uh, fourth grade report card of my great grandmother in 1916. So uh, this is the, the front of it. And this is the inside of the report card. So you can see there's really two sections. The top section here is uh, more didactic uh, classroom work. So reading, spelling, writing, arithmetic, so on and so forth. Um, I enjoy the neatness category. <laughs> um, but also you can see this bottom section here. And, and if you look closer, you can see that half of my great grandmother's fourth grade uh, report card was actually the parents at home grading her, so my great great grandparents grading her on industrial work or pretty much farm work. And specifically, you can see that the care of livestock and poultry and milking, so the hus animal husbandry was part of the curriculum and of what students were graded on in, in classrooms in, 19, in Iowa in 1916. So really it was a part of everyone's life, even fourth grade children. And you can see there's some sections here where she could have improved, but altogether all very good. So um, now we'll go into also the early 1900s and I just have a couple pictures here to show what it looked like. So you can see uh, in this first picture here, there's some chickens out in free range, uh, free range systems with little huts um, and lots of space. And this second picture is actually something really interesting I found when I was preparing for this talk. And it's a picture of the Honeywell building uh, at the Harvard Children's Hospital in Boston. This picture is from 1914. The building is still there. And you can see that uh, it's quite a bit different. It's near, near downtown, the heart of Boston. And you can see that there were some dairy cows right across the street from the Children's Hospital. So agriculture literally was everywhere, even in uh, developing cities in the early 1900s. So being in Maryland at the University of Maryland and going over to the uh, Domarva Peninsula, which is um, has a lot of broiler chickens, so meat chickens, um, I have to do a little plug for um, Cecile Steele. She really was the first entrepreneur in the broiler industry, and that happens to be here. So I think this is a neat little feather in our women in agriculture cap here. Uh, and it was serendipitous. She ordered 50 birds and 500 were delivered, and she made so much money that she decided to build a house 
for 10,000 in 1926. And as they say, the rest is history. Uh, but the, the broiler chicken industry really was, uh, was born here. So moving a, a, few, a few decades later um, was the industrial boom. Uh, so animals, uh, we had more people, uh, we had further advancements in technology. So animals were condensed and taken inside to be uh, taken away from the, um, the outdoor predation, the weather changes, so they could control husbandry better. So um, there was increased hygiene um, and disease incidents because in the case of laying hens, um, they were individually caged or in small groups so you could see the individuals better because they were partitioned. So um, there were smaller groups and with uh, laying hens, as, as uh, Shannon and I were just talking about, uh, there's definitely a pecking order. You know, the, the term pecking order came from, from chickens. And when they were in these smaller groups that decreased social stress and uh, administering antibiotics and medications were easier. And um, it was just generally, e it's generally easier to manage the birds when they're all in one area and you don't have to catch them. And therefore, it was better human working conditions. Um, I don't know how many people spend most of the time outside, but generally in temperature controlled areas. So really, in the 1950s, moving animals inside lowered the cost of production and increased food avail availability, the economy and sustainability of the, the animal agriculture industry. I'm using a lot of poultry examples because I work in poultry, but really this is true for all animal livestock. And something else that I think is really interesting is we've really lost touch with agriculture. Society has lost touch from agriculture and I'll go into this further, but um, 1951 was the peak year of tractor sales in the United States. And this, is, is important, I think, because right around the 1950s, um, the small farmers fell, after the Great Depression and the Second World War, smaller family farms fell victim to hard financial times and disappeared. Whereas the enterprises that had the money to invest in the tractors and the new facilities um, grew. And this is how we started condensing and, and the smaller farms um, could not survive. So moving into the 1960s and 70s, uh, this is really the boom of integration. So more condensing. Um, and uh, I have the term vertical integration down here because this is really um, the structure of animal agriculture now where it's one company owns and controls multiple stages of production. So feed mills, um, parent stock, hatchery, grow out, processing plant transportation and marketing, you know, some some companies, Tyson and Purdue, have their uh, label on the product, whereas um, some don't. Um, but vertical integration has really, really came um, into full force at this time. But also around this time, this is where animal welfare started coming into society and people started having opinions about animal welfare and for good reason. Um, so, Really, the Europe is, is in a much different uh, space than the United States in terms of animal welfare, but um, we're about a decade or so behind, and, it, and here is a, is a good example. So really, the first time animal welfare came into any conversation was when Ruth Harrison came out with her book, Animal Machines, and this is where the term factory farm was coined. And really, the book targeted um, confinement, so battery cages for laying hens, gestation crates for sows, and, and, and crates for veal. But also for physical alterations, such as tail docking, castration, and beak trimming. Um, and it, with good reason. So um, in, the, in terms of tail docking, castration, and castration, there really should be some local anesthetic or, or painkillers applied because it is painful. And something that I find really interesting and I like to tell people is just because the animals can't communicate that they're in pain or don't display pain in the way that we perceive it doesn't mean that they aren't in pain. And a good example is that um, open heart surgery was performed on infants without any sort of anesthetic until the 1980s. 
until a research project found that indeed children later in life were more sensitive to pain. So any uh, moving on uh, in 1975 in the United States, this was really the first year that animal welfare came into to society. And this was Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation. And he coined the term speciesism. So it's an ism. So um, it's, it's, it was a more humanitarian tone where um, it, it was animal rights, really. Um, he, he describes animal, animal rights as, as being environmental, social, and a, and a moral issue. And as a side note, um, you know, Peter Singer um, was in academia as well. So moving on, um, in the 1990s to today, really, uh, we have technological innovation. I have this um, automated milker here where the cows know when they're ready and they get on this little um, little turnstile here and it's timed perfectly to milk them in the right amount of time. And a lot of dairies are moving towards this. And uh, also I have a picture of a, a broiler house with a, with a controller system and you can see all these little arrows are things that are, that are really operated by a computer. So feed, temperature, humidity, um, and anyone who has chickens um, in these houses knows that they have set ranges for each thing and they get a phone call at whatever time of day it happens. Um, so it's really precision agriculture is where we're at today. And this is because we're, um, as our e economy is growing, um, U.S. Uh, people are eating more animal protein. Generally, that's the trend. So um, in, in 2020, uh, the average U.S. American ate uh, 56 pounds of beef, 50 pounds of pork, and 96 pounds of chicken. So you can see here around the, the early 90s, chicken surpassed beef and pork because it uh, is a cheaper protein. And uh, finally, uh, genetic selection for, in, in the case of chicken, it's feed efficiency, but for dairy cows, it would be milk yield. Um, we've been selecting for, for quite a few years now, over, over half a century. And today, or uh, last year in 2019, to put it in perspective, the average broiler or meat chicken feed conversion ratio was 1.8. So that means for every pound of food that a broiler chicken eats, it puts on um, eight tenths of a pound. That's just amazing uh, feed efficiency. So uh, I like to, to show this graph for feed efficiency. This is uh, US domestic corn use. And you can see that for feed and residual use, so for feeding corn to animals, since 1980, really it hasn't changed at all and we have more animals, we're feeding more animals. So we're feeding more animals with the same amount of corn. And that's just another, another uh, amazing innovation um, in agriculture. So that's a little bit of history and um, how we got to today. And now I'm going to go into some perceptions of agriculture and animal welfare and where this disconnect is. So, um, in 1800, in the year 1800, 90% of the jobs in the U.S. were farming. And today, less than 2% of Americans are farmers. Obviously, the Industrial Revolution happened and we have technology and, and healthcare jobs now. But it goes to show that most of us are generations removed from farming. We don't see how ag agriculture works or where our food comes from anymore and we don't usually see farm animals. So I like to show this comic that's, uh, you know, a cell phone with the baby cell phone looking at an old picture of uh, their ancestor and it says, that's right, dears, our ancestors had tails. And, you know, my students have never used a phone that was corded in their life. And it's just interesting that, you know, some of that knowledge is lost in generations. And so really, this comes true for animals as well. We're sort of coming into an era where, um, you know, back in our grandparents' age, the pets were kept outside. 
And of course now, um, my my pets are certainly my family. I'm sure a lot of a lot of y'all as well. But but also historically, uh, farm animals are also uh, becoming more popular pets. So you can see this horse here has its own couch, um, and we dress our pets. But we also there's a there's a chicken diaper industry. There's a chicken uh, harness industry, and you can see that they're they're sort of coming together. So people have pets at home and they know how they treat their pets and they don't understand why agricultural animals are not treated the same way. So really, uh, for housing systems and animal welfare in the past, the uh, animal agricultural systems were very extensive, right? They were outside, there were large areas of land that were uh, utilized with um, a lot of labor, very labor intensive and very uncontrolled. You know, if, if animals are outside, you can't control the weather or predation. You can try your best, but if there's a will, there's a way. Um, and then uh, they became more intensive, as, as I mentioned before, but really there's this push now to go from intensive back to extensive because um, our current generation doesn't doesn't know the past of why it became more intensive. So animal welfare truly is in the eye of the beholder, and I'm going to go into more depth in this, but really I'm saying that different stakeholders have different perspectives and definitions of animal welfare. And so what is a stakeholder? A stakeholder is a person or an organization with any investment or interest or concern in something, especially in business. So for animal agriculture, it's the companies that produce the animals. It's the, the governing entities or the, the regulatory agencies, and that's the USDA. And then there's the consumer, of course, and then there's animal activists as well, all, all our stakeholders. Um, but in the United States, in the case of animal agriculture, the consumer truly is the primary stakeholder that's driving the dynamics of, of change and how livestock and poultry are raised on, on farms. So now I'll go into the fundamentals of animal welfare science. So uh, here I've got a, a nice infographic of, of animal welfare and everything that can affect animal welfare or where animal welfare can play a role in, in other areas. So you can see that in, in red here are things that um, as scientists we can look into. But the yellow circles, uh, public perception, economics, legislation, and ethics are all um, more socioeconomic uh, components of animal welfare. And so for these red circles here, as an animal welfare scientist, it really takes a holistic approach with multi multidisciplinary research teams to maintain the sustainable solutions. And I'm going to go into more detail on what I mean by that. So uh, taking a step back, I'd like to clarify the difference between animal rights and animal welfare. Um, and I just want to mention that animal, I, I say animal welfare, which is really the European word and well-being is more of the US term, but um, my, my master's advisor was British, so I, I stuck with animal welfare. So animal rights are the rights of animals claimed on ethical grounds to the same, to, and that, that they deserve the same humane treatment and protection from exploitation and abuse as humans. And this picture down here is actually at the Silver Spring Farmer's Market. And Silver Spring um, or Bethesda area was where PETA was actually formed in our area. And uh, coming from Iowa, I've never actually seen real animal <laughs> activists in real life. So I had to snap a picture. Um, so that's animal rights, where really um, animal rights organizations feel that animals should have no use for hum humans, should not use them for any purpose, um, because we don't have the right to do that. Animals have their own rights. But in terms, but moving to animal welfare, it's really defined as the quality of life as perceived by the animal. And um, probably most of you recognize this iconic person here, Temple Grandin. Uh, she's one of my favorite people ever. I sat once, sat next to her once and was just frozen solid with the nerves, but she really truly is, is the voice of um, 
of animals and she's really any processing plant for cattle or pigs she's had a, a hand in designing and so uh, going into animal welfare basics another way that we can define animal welfare in, it, uh, is the state of animal of an animal in regards with its attempt to cope with its environment so in the previous slide it's how they perceive it but perception is pretty hard to quantify in science um, because they can't communicate with us, you know, verbally. But um, really what animal welfare scientists try to do is to um, measure how the animal is coping with its environment. And really there are two, two major uh, concepts that we have, and, and that's the five freedoms and the three circles. So um, really evolution is a good example of how animals have adapted to their environment and one of my favorite examples is the giraffe tongue I, I worked at a zoo for a stint and um the giraffe tongue is not only 18 to 20 inches long it's prehensile which means that it um can grasp and it is blackish purple to prevent sunburn so really the giraffe tongue and the giraffe and its tongue evolved to grab leaves from the tops of trees in, in the hot savanna and um in for for poultry this brings a good point about why we why we raise chickens and that is because they are precocial and the term precocial means that uh, when they're born they can stand they can walk they can eat and drink on their own they can't quite thermoregulate yet but here uh, is a, a video that I took of chicks that had just been hatched that morning drinking. And so uh, as humans, we are altricial, which means that, you know, we can't do anything as babies. We fully rely on our, on our parents. Our vision isn't developed yet. Um, and it's, it's quite different. So poultry and specifically um, were domesticated for our use because uh, they are precocial. So moving into uh, the three circles and the five freedoms, uh, the three circles are really how we approach animal welfare, really what constitutes animal welfare. So um, there's the three circles are effective state, natural living, and basic health and biological functioning. And really this basic health and biological functioning is where the research has been focused, but we really need to start looking more into natural living and effective states. Um, and the other concept is the five freedoms. So the book that I mentioned um, by, by um, the Animal Machines book in the 1960s, uh, this was in Europe, and the, a year later, the Bramble Committee came up with these five freedoms. So it was very much in response to this book. And the five freedoms are um, freedom from hunger and thirst, which is uh, pretty pretty easy to tell for the most part. Um, we provide feed and hunger, we provide feed and water, but if we don't see the animal actively eating and drunk, drinking, we're not sure if they're hungry or thirsty. Uh, freedom from discomfort, so providing an appropriate environment. Freedom from pain, injury, and disease, um, so vaccines and, and treatment. Uh, freedom to express natural behavior, so providing space for to perform behaviors and facilities and having the company of its own kind. Um, you know, all, all of our agricultural animals are, are herd species and they are prey animals, so they need they are very much have the, the flock or the herd mentality. And freedom from fear and distress. So by ensuring that conditions and treatments uh, avoid mental suffering. So some of these are, are pretty easy to, to measure and assure, but others not so much. And I like to show this picture. Uh, so uh, on one side, you can see a chicken on a beach. I went to Kauai last year wish I could say I went anywhere in the past few months, but uh, the, if you ever go to the island of Kauai, you will see that there are chickens absolutely everywhere. So this chicken's natural behavior on the beach might be quite a bit different than uh, this other picture where chickens are in um, a, a chicken house, a broiler house. So 
Um, and the chickens are quite different themselves. One grew up on an island and the other has grown up in um, commercial conditions. Should we expect them to perform the same behaviors? Um, I think the answer is no. So it's really in context. So diving more into to the definitions and, and foundation of animal welfare, uh, the first time we ever heard the term homeostasis was uh, Walter Cannon. And really, homeostasis is the fight or flight response, right? So your adrenaline gets pumping, it's your physical reaction to maintaining homeostasis. And then uh, Hans Selye called it the general adaptation syndrome, which mainly is freeing energy in your body to come back to homeostasis. So it's this adaptation energy. And um, welfare, as we mentioned, is an animal trying to cope with its environment. But really, it's this, if, if, if it's not coping with its environment very well, then it's under stress. It's the biological response elicited when an individual perceives a threat to its homeostasis. And the, the, the word perceives is important because, you know, uh, it might not actually be a threat. But if, it if the animal perceives the threat, then it actually is uh, a stressful situation and can be detrimental to them. And then um, ethology is just the study of animal behavior. So really, going back into the, my point of, of the past and animal husbandry being a part of, of culture, really, when we talk about animal welfare, it's animal husbandry. It's how we care for animals. And really, that's management. So for me, animal husbandry, animal management, and animal welfare are all very related, related and almost equivalent in some contexts. So um, stress really isn't that bad. In fact, if we didn't have a stress response, we would die. We need that adaptation energy. If we couldn't respond to stressors, we would not live very long. So short, mild stressors such as exercise um, or taking an exam, I guess, for students can actually be good. So that's you stress, good stress. Um, has anyone heard of endorphins? So um, you know, that also happens during stress when you're working out. And um, endorphins are also released with stress hormone, which is cortisol for humans. And um, so there can be good. So short-term use stressors can increase performance because of this repartitioned energy. However, the stressor needs to stop. And if the stress doesn't stop, then the response is now distress and becomes uh, detrimental. So I just have this picture here showing, you know, fight or flight was evolutionarily good for us to get away, um, but chronic can uh, drain you, essentially, I guess, like a battery. And the consequences of chronic stress in, uh, include fatigue, uh, decreased feed intake and body weight, uh, decreased immune response, and then uh, a higher susceptibility to disease with animals and humans. So, uh, so that's the stress response, and that's a, a foundational part of animal welfare. But also ethics are a big part of the foundation of animal welfare, and ethics are a system of moral standards or sets or beliefs. And uh, es ethics differ from morals in that ethics are usually held by a culture. Um, so really, your, our culture is what's shaping how we view animal welfare. And something else that um, is really important to think about for ethics is that they need to be justified. Morals don't always, they don't need to be justified because they're your personal morals. But ethics um, need to be justified because they're uh, more held by a body of people. So I have this, this cost-benefit scale here because there's no one answer for every situation. It's very context-dependent. And that's because there's an ethical component. So when we look at animal welfare standards, uh, they involve both science and ethics. And what is, we, a culture has to decide what is acceptable or unacceptable based on their social beliefs and it's not founded in science. So really it's balancing what's desired and practical. So using the cost benefit analogy, 
what does science say versus what society wants? And I'll give you a good example of how they can conflict. But really, it's about the consumers and what the stakeholders are pushing for. So the best part of science is that it provides unbiased information that we can use to make informed decisions about animal welfare. So uh, I'm just going to go into a few of the hot topics uh, right now in society. And really, they're, in terms of animal agriculture, there's four main categories, and that's housing, physical alterations, genetics, and euthanasia. So for housing, it's uh, really um, confinement. So for veal, veal, cow, um, veal calves, pigs, laying hens, and how much space they're provided. You can see a, a sow in a stall here, um, and then hens in a, in a cage-free aviary. Um, and then physical alterations, so dehorning, toe trimming, and tail docking, as we've we talked about before. And then genetics. So uh, for me, a research area I've looked into or done research in is, is slow growing broilers. So uh, there's some consumer concern about the growth rate of broilers being too fast. And then gene editing. So uh, GMOs, CRISPR, Cas9, um, that sort of uh, technology. And then also euthanasia. So how animals are stunned in the processing plant. Um, you know, and, and certain um, halal and uh, kosher slaughter is performed differently. Um, and then male layers have really become uh, a big area of consumer concern and also research. Um, there's a lot of money being put forth. And in the next couple of years, uh, or in the next year, there will be a technology to determine the sex of embryos before the chicks hatch. So um, I made a comment earlier about how Europe is, I don't want to use the term further ahead, but they've definitely put more effort forth in assuring animal welfare as a country. So um, this is just a comparison of, of the EU versus the United States. And really, there's federal legislation in the European Union for how animals are raised on farms. But in the United States, we don't have any, and it's really the retailers and the states that are, um, are regulating that. So you can see uh, in 1998 um, was the first protection for farm animals in the EU. In 1999, they banned battery cages. And in 2003, uh, they banned gestation crates. So going over to the United States, also in 1998, uh, McDonald's actually was the very first organization to develop animal welfare uh, guidelines. Um, and this is voluntary. So it's really the, uh, the retailers and the, the distributors that are, are, um, that are guiding the animal welfare guidelines. And then also state statutes. So uh, Florida was the first state in 2003 to ban um, battery cages, gestation uh, crates, and uh, veal stalls. So really, in, in focusing in on the US, there are two federal livestock animal welfare laws to date. The first is the 28-hour law which uh, really says that animals cannot be transported for more than 28 continuous hours without having rest or being provided uh, food and water. And then the other is the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, which is at the processing plant and poultry are not included under this act. Um, and these laws are both limited to animal transportation and slaughter, but right now there are no federal laws that regulate the husbandry of livestock and poultry, that's really at the, the state statute and retailer level. So it's really the industry. So um, the various animal industry and commodity groups have established voluntary guidelines containing the best management practices. And that's really what the industry follows. And I'll, I'll go into more detail on that. So this is just uh, an infographic or a map here of states that have animal confinement laws. So uh, you can see it's really sort of um, predominantly on the coasts. 
so all of the west coast um, along the, the ocean in any way and then um, a handful of others so this is how many states that uh, have animal confinement laws and then these are the states with anti whistleblower laws so those are laws that prevent animal rights activists from becoming employees of a company and secretly recording and releasing undercover videos with uh you know some some music playing to portray the animal production industry as a bad actor and these laws have been passed in seven states but have not passed in 19 states and i think that this is really important to think about because the people are deciding you know there's only seven states passed them and in 19 of them um people did not want that so that's animal welfare in the US and, and, and where we've come to. And so how do we actually measure it? So uh, we have laws, guidelines, certification programs, and audit tools. So we talked about laws and the guidelines are really documents that contain the information on how to perform different procedures such as handling. And these are useful for training purposes. Uh, certification programs provide an official document attesting to a status or a level of achievement and we'll go and we'll look at a couple examples of uh, animal welfare certification programs and then the audit tool is really the the welfare standards or that are usually species specific and facility specific and the audits can be performed by first second and third parties um, but the third party audits are really uh, what the uh, companies are held to. So when we measure animal welfare, there are really two ways to measure it. One is animal-based measures, so actually look at the animal, and then the other is uh, their environment or resource-based measures. So the animal-based measures are individual, and then um, for the resources, it's really for the group. So, uh, you can see some examples here for animal-based measures. Um, you can look at their behavior, their movement, their activity, how the individual versus the group. In the case of laying hens, that's very important. And vocalizations. Um, everyone knows their animal and how they sound and, and what they want and what they need or what they don't have or, or, or need. Um, and then also physiology, so basic health. It's the easiest thing to measure. You go to the doctor, you have your temperature recorded, and you get the little uh, pulse oximeter on your finger to look at your blood oxygenation. So this is uh, easily recordable body weight, uh, condition, disease. You've got a body condition score here of, of cows. And then stress. Um, so cortisol is, is the stress hormone that you could measure. So for resource-based measures, it's just looking at the animal's environment and specific to the species needs. So feed and water quality, is the feed formulated for the appropriate age of the animal? Flooring type and quality, uh, that's very important with dairy cattle. Um, and, and light, that's very important for, for poultry because of photoperiodism and reproduction. Um, and, and air temperature, humidity, and ventilation, and a good example of what's measured in animal welfare assessments is, is ammonia levels, and it has to be uh, below 25 parts per million. So, mentioned uh, National Producer Organization guidelines, and uh, because I work with chickens, I have the National Chicken Council as an example. So really, they're the trade association that serves to be the voice of the broiler industry, but also they're the organization that has the, the national animal welfare guidelines. So those are really the, the foundation of guidelines that all of the, the companies follow. And then there's certification programs. And really, animal welfare certification programs are programs that, that uh, producers pay, they pay for an auditor to certify them. Um, GAP or Global Animal Partnership at Whole Foods is, the, is really the, the standout example because they put their label, uh, well, all of them put their label. So really it's the label that the producers are paying for that assures the consumers who are buying that product that the animals are cert certified as, as humanely raised. So. You can see here 
the, the GAP program is actually a six step program. Um, and you can see that the requirements become more and more uh, strict. So you can see here in this, this, this basic no step, there's no outdoor access, there's no space requirements. And then if you go all the way down to the five plus here, it's almost, it's almost Amish uh, production where everything is done on the same site. There's no transportation. Um, they're provided outdoor access. Only certain breeds of animals can be raised. And um, you can just see it, that this is a very good example because people have the choice for what level of animal welfare standards their, their products uh, for the animals that their products came from. So uh, I'll just wrap things up by talking about future challenges. So uh, something that I'm very interested in and, and spent a lot of time looking into and talking about is sustainable animal welfare. In a lot of uh, organizations, I've noticed that animal welfare is really grouped under the sustainability umbrella. And so sustain animal welfare, any type of animal welfare is only sustainable if it is strongly approved by society. So it's a socioeconomic development. Uh, I like to mention that in the United States, we treat animals better than some countries treat their own people. So really it's, it's animal welfare standards and, and guidelines or regulations are related to socioeconomic development. So you can see that there's policy, science, economics, and pu public concern, and it's really a balance between those four. They can't be uh, rooted in just one. So uh, to define sustainability, it, it's really the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level. And so, um, in other words, systems must operate to meet the current population's needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So in the past, sustainable systems were those that minimized the depletion of resources or con contaminant emissions that were harmful to the environment. Sustainability was mostly related to environmental sustainability. But today, sustainability has a much broader term and application because systems that are unsustainable are unsustainable because the public finds them unsustainable and it could affect, it could be related to the environment, human health, or animal welfare. And animal welfare is really a factor that remains important and will always remain important, at least in the U.S., because if people don't accept it, then it's not a sustainable system. However, as an animal welfare scientist, I must make the point that some actions that improve animal welfare also do improve the environment or human health, but not always. It's not, it's not always um, apples to apples. So um, as I mentioned, sustainable animal producers uh, adopt husbandry practices and housing facilities that are acceptable to the public. However, there can be some discrepancies between public perception and the actual welfare conditions, how they actually affect the animals. And then uh, and these systems are often considered more sustainable or welfare friendly than others. And um, there's no better example, in my opinion, than cage-free eggs. Um, we're going cage-free, we, uh, Walmart is going cage-free, um, and I think really that puts it into context if Walmart's going cage-free soon. But compared to conventional or battery cages, cage-free housing systems provide more space per bird and environmental complexity to promote natural behaviors. So this really are three main environmental enrichments, as we call them, and that's perches, nest boxes, and scratch pads. So the perches um, uh, allow the hens to perform perching behavior or roosting. A lot of hens like to sleep while they're perching. The nest box is so they have a designated area to lay their eggs and usually there's some privacy curtains there because um, chickens are really drawn to red and when a chicken lays, an, when a hen lays an egg, the, um, the vagina is inverted and chickens are really drawn to red. So it just provides her from, from privacy uh, so they don't get pecked at. And then a scratch pad to promote foraging behavior. 
And uh, some, some systems even have a little area where the feed will drop on the scratch pad so they can actually forage for feed. So you can see this is UEP here, the, UE, the United Egg Producers, which is another producer organization, has um, a nice infographic on, on what it looks like here. And this is another picture of um, a cage-free aviary. And I'd like you to notice um, that it's tiered, right? So really, it, it's still layers of, of levels, but the, the doors are open. You know, they're not in cages. They can choose to maneuver to different levels. And then there's a, a floor area here at the bottom. However, um, until recently, uh, I think that the housing designs have improved quite a bit. But originally, a lot of laying hens, um, some reports even up to 80% of hens in cage-free systems had fractured or broken keel bones. Um, because of they were jumping, as you can see in this last picture here, there's no ramps. So if a hen at the very top jumps down to the bottom and uh, their keels are, are, their bones are a little more delicate because they're putting the calcium from their bones into the, into the eggs, um, they are more prone to, to keel damage to that bone. So if you look at these different indicators uh, of animal welfare here, there's conventional cages, furnished cages are, um, uh, enriched colony cages, which did not catch on in the United States. They're much more popular in Europe, but my guess is that they didn't take off in the U.S. because the word cage is in them. But they're basically like cage-free systems that have the perches and the scratch pads and the nest boxes, but they are in cages still. So then there's non-cage systems um, and then outdoor free range. So if you look at all these indicators of, of animal welfare here, you can see that the mortality, so the birds that die, there's actually a much higher likelihood of birds to die in outdoor systems because of obvious reasons, right? They're out in the elements, there's predation, there's ectoparasites, endoparasites, um, there's dirt. You know, we only know so much of what, what's actually in the dirt. And if we look at um, mortality. So cannibalism can become a huge issue with laying hens again because they can they can see in the infrared spectrum. Uh, so they're very drawn to red. So that's why cannibalism can become an issue also with the pecking order. But if we look at bone strength and fractures, really none of them um, are all that great. Um, so really housing design needs to be improved. And then exposure to disease, parasites as I mentioned, Mumblefoot is an infection of the foot pad. Feather loss uh, is, seems pretty across the board. Um, piling and smothering, of course, if they're not separated in cages, there's a higher potential for that. Predation happens outdoor. And then egg cleanliness can be an issue. If you don't have your hens trained to lay in the nest boxes, you can get some floor eggs. So um, really, so there's not one full answer. There's no system here that's all green. So it's, it's all about management. It's how you manage the system. So now I'll just finish up with international welfare standards. And um, really it's the OIE, the World Organization for Animal Health. It used to be called something else. That's why the acronym doesn't really match the name, but it's the intergovernmental organization responsible for improving global animal health and welfare. The United States joined in 1975, if that year rings a bell for you at all previously. And recently, the World Trade Organization uh, recognized the OIE as a reference organization in 2018. And that means that it's recognized whatever the, the OIE puts out, the governments in, all the, in, in the 182 members use these guidelines and their policies and their reports. So the OIE is very important. So you can see in this infographic here that they're still working on laying hens, probably because of what we were just looking at. There's no sure answer, but, but we're getting there. So you can see that there's all sorts of adopted standards for what they're calling terrestrial animals, farmed fish, and then uh, they have some uh, guidelines for disaster uh, and risk management. So um, the Animal Protection Index was released uh, a few years ago, and they ranked 
all the countries in the world for their animal welfare. So you can see in this, this map here, there are some countries that don't have any grades. So you can see that the countries that have the best standards are A, Bs are another green, C is yellow, uh, D is peach, and, and G, which I didn't even know you could get a letter G as a grade, um, is, is a dark maroon. So um, the top five are Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland, the UK, and, and Chile which sort of surprised me, but you can see that there are several countries, many countries that don't have any colors and that's because they don't have any animal welfare standards. And if you look at this map, you can see most of these countries um, are third world. Where is the United States? Well, we are number 31, which is, is not good, but so how is this is this index created? We, we have a D. So I, took a screenshot of all of the reasons, so all the grades for all the different standards, and this grade is based on all animals for all uses. So we have exhibition, entertainment, research, wild animals. Um, so you can see there's all different components in this, but really for the talk today, we have rec recognized that animals are sentient in the U.S., but there we, we've got to see, I guess, is the best grade we've gotten in anything. And we um, do not protect our animals used in, in farming, according to this index. So lots of opportunities for improvement, which is where I'd like to end my talk today. So challenge always brings innovation. Um, and this is a good example. So. I'll go into a little bit on the research, which is what I'm very interested in, and that's um, using the animal as their own sensor. I mentioned that it's easy to measure biological things because you can record a heart rate, but animals can't communicate or we don't know how to interpret how they communicate with us to determine how they're feeling. So this is a little nice little infographic I got from a paper. I'm a little sad that they didn't put anything on the chicken, but you can rest assured that I will mention that. And so what do I mean by the animal as the sensor? It's really anything that we can quantify on the animal to interpret what, what's going on. So there's wear, wearable sensors. You can put a, a, an RFID tag or an accelerometer. They have Fitbits for all sorts of animals. So looking at steps. Um, I know that uh, one of our research facilities at the University of Maryland, the, the, the dairy cows, there's a sensor um, that measures how many swallows the, the cow takes and they can predict how much feed they've consumed that way. Um, there's infrared thermography, so looking at surface temperatures, acoustic variations, um, so measuring vocalizations, uh, GPS, so looking at where animals spend more of their time, um, and then video imaging for behavior analysis. And then there's, there's real-time sensors for, um, for saliva and, and things, which is coming. So these are just a few examples that I've come across in, in my research. And um, so the Kinect camera is what is used in Xboxes to you know, move along. They are, people are actually using Kinect cameras to uh, predict body weight. So the animal walks underneath and you can uh, predict and measure how much body weight the animal um, has put on. Uh, so with vocalizations, you can focus on the, the pitch and the frequency of, of the vocalizations of the animal. So you can see that uh, this is a comfort. This first uh, picture is the comfort. And you can see there it looks much different on the graph than when an animal is in discomfort or cold stressed. So you look at the frequency and amplitude of the actual sound. And also you can, with, with the case of chickens, um, with broiler chickens, they're typically in a house with 20,000 20, other housemates in a big area. So really we can look at the group movement patterns. So um, uh, Marianne Dawkins has uh, had 20 years worth of research looking at uh, the flock distributions and how they can be a, a sensor of how their welfare is. Um, and then this is uh, just a little video here of a project that I'm working on with the University of Maryland Computer Science Department where we are 
um, working on a project to detect chickens. So you can see the different numbers here, but we're also assigning behaviors. So hopefully we can in the future create a system where we can detect and predict how the animal well, the welfare of the, the chicken will be based on the behavior that it's displaying in this moment. So to summarize, the take home messages I'd like you to have from this talk is that animal welfare has a strong presence in society. It also includes ethics and science. It's not a, it, this is why I love this series because it's not a pure science. There's always, you, you have to see everything in a holistic manner. Um, animal welfare science is continuous improvement. The animal welfare guidelines will continually be evolving because we're learning more. We're finally figuring out how to translate what the animals are telling us. And then animal welfare science advances our knowledge of how animals cope with their environment. And you can see here that hopefully y'all aren't like these chicks in this picture. So to, to wrap up, I'd just like to do a final shameless plug. Um, I have a group called the Poultry Extension Collaborative, or PEC, as you, you could call it, with uh, some fabulous other assistant professors at Virginia Tech, Purdue, and NC State. And if you would like any information on uh, poultry welfare topics, please come to our website. We have a Facebook page, and we have uh, monthly newsletters, and we'd love to, to have you. And with that, I will take any questions. Great, we definitely have some here in the chat pod. I'll go up to one of the first ones. Um, when you were talking about the physical alterations being prohibited in farms, they're performed for better appearance of the animals, um, it, like tail docking. So um, I don't know if you can comment on that. Aren't the physical alterations prohibited in farms when they're performed for better appearance of the animals? So um, that's a good question, and I would like to mention that it's really, it's not for a better appearance. So when you're tail docking pigs, if you think about it, animals, all animals, um, investigate with their mouth and their nose. So a pig roots, a chicken pecks, and if you are a pig, and you see a, wag, uh, a wagging tail in front of you and you want to investigate it, what are you gonna do? You're gonna use your mouth and you're going to bite it. So tail docking in pigs, for example, is performed for uh, aggression and reasons, but tail docking in dairy cattle, for example, um, I, I, in, when I give a lecture on animal welfare, I have a, an ethical situation where, uh, that involves tail docking with, with cows. So, Tail docking has routinely been performed for hygiene reasons. You cut off the bottom portion of the tail and then it's, it, it doesn't come in contact with the udders and um, it can cause higher rates of mastitis. So really the physical alterations is to sort of have a, to, to eliminate the opportunity for issues. It's not necessarily preventing them because maybe they wouldn't have happened in the first place but it's a management technique for easier management. But we're finding that, um, you know, an animal, you know, wagging its tail might actually need that end of it to fully perform their behaviors. Um, another, a good example I think is probably decline cats. So it's, it's not a foolproof answer, but it really is to, it's for the animal's benefit, but it might not actually be depending on how it's performed. Great. Okay. Um, they were, so you talked about some of the certification badges that uh, farms can get. Um, somebody commented that that could help farmers get better prices for their products. So they use that sort of in a marketing sense? Yes, most definitely. The animal certification programs are definitely um, for a label. It's marketing. So you get the certification so you can put that label on your product. There's there's others, there's um, humane, um, humane handled and certified. Let's see, there's a humane organization um, and um, also organic is another, uh, another certification uh, program that I didn't talk about at all. Um, but that's another where, you know, if, if you raise your animals to USDA organic standards, then you get the organic label. All right. Um, 
just curious, are ships carrying 6,000 head of cattle, like the one that recently sank, commonplace around the world and in the U.S.? You know, that's a really interesting question because I had no idea that that happened until I went to Hawaii. So I went to Hawaii last year actually for a work thing. I only stayed an extra eight days because I had to. <laughs> but um, uh, So I went to the University of Hawaii and we talked about agriculture. And um, it actually, so they actually do have a pretty booming beef cattle industry, but it is cheaper for them to put the cows on a ship and ship them to California to be processed than to actually process them in Hawaii. And so I think that there are certain situations like that where it's the economic and logistic, well, not the logistic, but the, the economic drive that. But um, so that's for more local. I think that there is, I don't think there's as much of that for export or importing, but that's that's not really my field, but it does happen. All right, there's another question about, do you find useful any phone applications for measuring animal welfare? Yes, actually, there are quite a few out there. And as with anything with apps, there's a ton of them. There's 10 for anything you could imagine you ever wanted to do. Um, I, there's, it might be, so I work with, with poultry, but I know that they have them for different, uh, species of animals and I can, um, if you contact me, so let's see here, I'll come to my, my first slide here to show you my contact information, please. Everyone do contact me. Um, you know, I, I need to stay relevant in this area too. So ask me a question that makes me learn something. I would love that. So. There are quite a few, but I don't think that there's one blanket app uh, today. Okay. All right. There's another question about the laying hens. So it says, it seems like vocalization if laying hens is not determinative of welfare because they seem to vocalize when they're individually laying an egg. Ah, yes, I'm very <laughs> familiar with that sound. <laughs> so think about what's happening there and think about what the head might be feeling and that will tell you what the vocalization is representative of. <laughs> I've not had a child, but <laughs> it uh, could be very similar. So it is uncomfortable and, and potentially painful for the hen. So they got to get that egg out, but it is a distressing situation in that context. So it's a, it's sort of a use stress situation, right? They're laying an egg. It's it's natural, but um, yeah, it is it is a stressful event for them for sure. <laughs> all right. Um, it looks like all the questions um, so far. Uh, what I will do is I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Okay. Uh, if people want to go ahead and um, if there was any other questions. There's a Q&A section or a chat section. You can add those to, um, but I am going to stop recording at this time.